Uh, hello, folks. Uh, good evening and a very warm welcome to today's uh, session of our critical care webinars of the uh, Young India Intensivist Forum. So today we have a practical demonstration of different lights and tubes uh, we use in the ICU. So I think it will be very useful to many of you, especially the younger ones. And the speaker today is Dr. Neha Arora. So she is a senior consultant in critical care in Paris hospitals and very well versed and good with all these procedures. So I hope you like this. We'll take any questions in the end. So first she'll do a live demonstration of all the lines and tubes, showing the actual lines and tubes. And in the end, there'll be some slides to cover what she couldn't cover. So with that, over to you, Dr. Neha. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Neha Arora. Uh, today, we are going to discuss the various tubes and lines that we are daily using in the ICU. Uh, various metallic, various plastic or other lines that are actually we are used either for the monitoring, either for the helping the patient in feeding in uh, for, as a or the other lines that we use for the urination, the feeding, the ventilators, the airways, protecting the airways. So there is a large variety, versatility of the lines. So I'm trying to cover as much as possible in this session, uh, showing you the actual whatever it is there and the things, the other lines which I am not able to show, actually virtually we are, then we are showing you in the slides, different slides so that you can understand how we are using it, for what purpose that we are using it, what are the uses in the ICU, specific, especially in the critical care unit. As the patients are very sick, so you have to, patient is sedated, paralyzed on the ventilator, so not able to do anything. But this is, patients on ventilator are totally dependent on the these lines and tubes. So these are various helpful to the patient for the monitoring for the doctor and for the patient also. So first, we are, I will start with the Riles tube. The Riles tube is the... So this is the Riles tube. This is a feeding tube that we are using these days. The patient who are uh, having the low conscious level like the traumatic brain injury, the stroke patients, the paralyzed patients, or the patients who are on the ventilator, they uh, we use these feeding tubes. These are the Riles tubes. These are having a thick... So it will show you this tube. At the tip of the tube, like... This year, at the tip of the tube, there is a color coding of the tube in which it shows the various sizes of the tubes. So this is a radiopaque marker that you can use, see even in the X-ray or even in the ultrasounds that you can use. After that, there are several markings on the tubes so that we can know the distance from the tip to the end. So this is the Riles tube. This is all having first the tip, which is the blunt end, so that it will not cause injury to the gastric mucosa or while putting the during the to the esophageal mucosa. After that, it has several holes here, if you can see. So these holes are the later multiple holes, so that even if it's blocked, the tip of the is blocked or one hole is blocked, the patient's nutrition is not compromised and we can feed him from the later holes. We can flush it also. So after that, there is a lot, they are marking on the tubes. Sometimes there are different companies that is use, producing these tubes. Some are having 10 centimeter markers or most of the tubes they have written how much centimeter of the tube is there. Like in this tube, they have written the 50 centimeter, 60 centimeter or the 70 centimeter. And at the end of the tube, this is the end of the tube. We can close it also. While opening it, you can put the feeding from here. You can do the suctioning, suction port. You, you can close it and put the suction port here so that we can take out the uh, suction, the gastric components like in the patients who are sedated, who are having acute abdomen, who are having abdominal obstruction in which you want to empty the stomach contents as much as possible. So you can put the suction also here and you can suction the gastric content so that the patient will not aspirate it. So this tube is basically used for the feeding, like in the poisoning patients also for the, doing the gastric lavage to prevent the consumption or the absorption of the toxins. You want to lavage within the first year. So in that cases also, you can put this tube in the stomach and to uh, lavage it, putting the uh, saline or activated charcoal and then sucking it back to prevent its further absorption. So there are different color markings of the tube. Like this tube is having the different colors, the green color, the orange color, that is, it depends upon the size of the tubes, the 12 French, the 14 French, 16 French, 
that I will later tell you in my slides that how is the color coding, what is the size to be used. Mostly we use 12 French, 14 and 16 French. The smaller the tube, the better it is because it's the it's flexible tube. It's very soft. It's made up of PVC material. Some are made of, sometimes they're made of the silicone also. But it helps in to, when you put the tube, there is always obstruction of the sinuses, the nasal or orogastric, whatever you are putting. There is obstruction of the sinuses. The smallest is the tube number, better for the patient because it helps to drain the sinuses also. It's not the blocking the opening passages of the sinuses. So they will also get drained and you can feed it properly, the patient with these tubes. So this is the Ryle's tube. The indication I have told you, feeding, nutrition in the unconscious, the patients on mechanical ventilation for the gastric lavage in the poisoning patients, in the abdominal obstruction, if you have to take out the gastric contents, these we are the proper indication of this tube. The color coding and other I have shown you, I will show you in the my slides. So this, this is the nasogastric or the orogastric tubes. There are some another tubes coming for the feeding and the patient who is having high gastric output. Mm -hmm. The residual volume of the gastric residual volume is very high. You are not able to tolerate the feed with these Ryle's tubes. In that cases, we have to use the nasogestional tubes, the NG tubes, because it helps to move again by the pyloric opening to the jejunum till the jejunum that tubes will reach and then they will feed the patients. Like in the pancreatitis patients, you know, don't want to put the normal, this Ryle's tube, you want to put it. Always we prefer the nasogestional tubes in which there are three ports. One is the uh, gastric port in which you can give the feeds that direct, another is the jejunal port and then the third is the air vent port in which you can just air ventilation, you have to go. So three ports are there. The gastric ports, mostly you have put them on sometimes on the aspiration, because you're feeding through the jejunum. So the gastric is not the juices and all, whatever is collected, you can aspirate from the gastric port. And the feeding can be continued with the jejunal ports. These are semi-elemental feeds that the pancreatitis patients will tolerate. The volume of the patients in the naso nasogestional feed uh, tubes are quite less as compared to the gas nasogastric tubes because these our gastric has a high capacity as compared to the jejunum. So semi-elemental 50 ml or 70 ml of the, the feed in the NJ we used to put. That I will show you in the slides, the NJ tubes. And that is used mostly put in the, by the fluoroscopy guided. These tubes you can put by just asking the patient to sitting in the faller's position or just uh, sitting position. Because these tubes, if the patient is conscious, like in the acute obstruction patient, the patient is conscious, you just want to take out the gastric components. In that, you have to put, the patient is quite awake. Or in the mechanical ventilated patients, they are quite sedated. In that, after proper lubrication and everything, you have to put the tube either the blindly or with the help of the Magill's forceps and the laryngoscope. So that under vision, you can put this tube into the esophagus and then put it further away till the mark of around in the males or females, we used to put on the 60 centimeter. Or if you want to measure the size, you can take from the tip of the nose to the ear lobule and from there to the tip of the zephy sternum. So that is the actual distance if you want to measure in different patients, like there are different physique of the patients, you can't uh, say, measure one level and to put every tube in that. So this is the procedure, lubricate the tube, ask the patient to sit in a uh, relaxed position, sitting position, put the adequate jelly and from the nasal nares, you can start putting that tube inside and ask the patient to swallow or deglute it as much as possible. So if they deglute it, it will go to the esophagus. But if the patient is paralyzed, if the patient is sedated on the ventilator, then you have to uh, put after using the laryngoscope with the magills. So this is the Ryle's tube. In, Orogastric, you can put in the oral in the ventilated patients or the nasogastric by putting in the uh, sedated patients or the conscious patients in that tube. So this is the feeding tube, Ryan's feeding tube. Then we have come to the next thing. So as I've shown you, there are different, this is the size, this is 16 gauge, this is the 18 gauge. So different color coding of the tubes according to the port is the color coded. So from where there you can imagine or it's written on the tube itself that how much French of the gauge of that internal diameter of the tube is there. Big tubes for the big built persons and small tubes for the 
smaller patients. So these are the Ryle's tubes. So I'm, I will show you three Ryle's tubes. This is the 16 gauge, 12 gauge, and the 18 gauge. Next, that we are coming on the, for the patients who are coming in shock or the patients who are coming to the ICU, they need fluid resuscitation. And the first thing, and the first thing that the doctor put in the patient is the intravenous cannula. So this is the cannula that we are using in the peripheral veins. Basically, we are using this cannula, whatever the veins we are using in the, under the skin, the peripheral skin, whatever veins, you can just put these cannula. So these cannulas are the intravenous flow systems in which you can put them into the vein and you can connect the intravenous tubes here and start the pushing the saline or the fluids to the patient. So these are also color coded. They have different lengths. These are the peripherally inserted only. So these, what we have to use, these are color coded. The pink is mostly 20 gauge. The green one is the 18 gauge. The gray one is 16 gauge. So there are different, different gauges with different length of the patient. Depending upon the type of vein you can put. If you are seeing a small vein, then you can put the 20 gauge or the 22 or 24. In the pediatric, we can use a 24 gauge also. But if you can see the good visible vein, you can use the 18 gauge. So what is the use of these intravenous cannulas? These are used to push the fluids, the medications, whatever the antibiotics, whatever intravenous medications we have to give the patients, we can give through these cannulas if the patient is in the ICU or even in the hospital. These are the must for all the doctors and the patients. So there are different, if you will ask me why this is color coded, because these are having different gauge of the uh, cannula, which shows the different flows of the fluids. Like this fluid, this cannula is having the high flow of the saline or the fluids as compared to the low gauge. 18 gauge is having high flow of the state around 260 ml than the, this gauge. So the difference is also in the length of the, the flow depends upon the length and the gauge. So as you can see, this is the 18 gauge catheter in which this is a 45 mm of the length of the, uh, of the catheter and the fluid flows at the rate of 85 ml per minute. As compared to this 20 gauge catheter, this 20 gauge is having the flow rate of 55 ml per minute. In one minute, the maximum capacity is 55 ml of the fluid can be given through this cannula. But if the patient is in shock, you want to give more. So this cannula is giving the 50, uh, 85 ml per minute. So these are the peripheral cannulas that we are using in the ICU. But if the patient is in shock, the veins are collapsed, you are not able to find any of the veins, then what is the answer? You have to give the medication, you have to give the fluids because the patient is in the shock. So these, then we can't use the peripheral veins. Then we, in that case, we mostly use this, this is the central venous catheter system in which we are using the central veins of the patient. Most commonly used are the internal jugular, the subclavian and the femoral. These three veins, <coughs> Sorry, these three veins are the most commonly used in the critical care and in most ICUs. What is the use of this? Because some, uh, for the patient is in shock, you have to give the fluid resuscitation. You have to give the vasopressor support. In that case, the vasopressors are quite irritant. You can't give from the peripheral lines. You can't give the 3% hypertonic solutions like 3% saline or some drugs like cardron, some irritant drugs. You can't give through the peripheral lines. In that case, we need the central lines because they are having good lumen in which you can give these hypertonic or the fluid with speed if you want to give the thing. So what is the CVP? This is a catheter, as you can see. This is a catheter, the polyvinyl chloride catheter that is quite friendly to the human skin or the human tissues. So these are having one lumen in which there are actually three lumens. So the, at the end, there you can see there are three ports. I don't know whether it's visible or not. I will show you as much as possible. So there are three ports, the distal, the lumen, and the central. So proximal, distal, and central, there are three ports. The proximal port is at the tip of the cyst. These are color-coded also. If you can see, this is the orange color and the blue color, and one is the white color. So there are different color codings 
in which and it's also written on that which one is the proximal, which one is the distal, which one is the medial. So at the tip of the central line, this is the maxis, the proximal is the bigger one, like it is the 18 gauge. The other two are mostly of the 16 gauge so ports. The total length of this center line is 15 centimeter. The French is a seven French and it is having three lumens. So gauge is different. The proximal one that is opening just at the proximal, distal and the medial, there are three one. So the one opening at the tip is having the maximum lumen. It's having the 16 gauge in which the fluids can go infusions. You can go at a higher speed. The other one is the medial one. If the, that is not working, the medial one and the distal one. There are three ports. You can attach the vasopressors, fluids, antibiotics, and you can do it. So that kit is available officially. What are the contents of and how to put the center lines? So I will not go into the detail how to put just a small. In between the two, in here at the lateral end of the neck, there are two heads of the sternocleidomastoid that is going and that is making an apex. And there is the, with the clavicle, it is making it the triangle. So at the tip of this triangle, around 4 to 2 to 3 centimeter above, putting the needle at 45 degree angle near the lateral shoulder, you have to, or the other side, you have to palpate the carotid. Carotid is the medial side and internal jugular vein is on the lateral side. But these days, nobody is putting these, uh, pricking the uh, internal jugular vein blindly. We have the ultrasound machines along with us in, in the intensive care. Because the patient is coagulopathic, you can't will rely on the blindly putting the lines. So put the ultrasound probe, check with the uh, carotid artery and the vein by the Doppler or by compressing the vein because the veins are always compressible and the arteries are not. So by uh, how to identify the internal jugular vein and then there is a needle here and the syringe. Put some saline in the syringe and while aspirating, you have to enter at the 45 degree angle with the lateral to line to the lateral direction and aspirating back. When the dark blood color of the vein is coming, then you have to enter the guide wire. There is a guide wire also inside it. There is a curved guide wire. Then you can enter the guide wire, secure it, take out the catheter, dilate the guide wire and then putting the another center line with the three ports and then securing it with the stitches and all. So this is the internal jugular or you can put in the subclavian or you can put in the femoral vein also. So these three are the main. So that for the intravenous axis, we are having a different kind of catheters. Like first, I have shown you the peripheral vein catheters. This is the central line catheters. And the third one that is coming as the peripherally inserted central catheters that we are saying as the pick lines. In pick lines, we are using the cephalic vein or the basilic vein which we are using with the ultrasound guided guidance, they are putting the same as in the Seldinger's technique. This technique of putting the, uh, first pricking the vein, putting the guide wire, dilating, and then putting the catheter is called the Seldinger's technique, which was invented by the Seldinger. So the pick line is basically, we have to uh, see the veins, identify the catholic or the basilic vein by the ultrasound. And with the same Seldinger, you can put the peripherally inserted central lines. Another lines are the, Tunneled CVC catheters. Tunneled catheters are basically used in the either oncology or the chemotherapy patients who are long-standing catheters because these central line catheters, these are for basically for the short duration. Even though they are coming these days with the antibiotic coated or other, but these are the sh for short duration. If you're putting the intravenous catheter like for the chemo ports or the chemotherapy lines, tunneled catheters like Hickman catheters we are using these days for the tunneled under the skin. So the proximal part is tunneled under the skin subcutaneously and then the catheter enters the central veins like the internal jugular veins, the femoral veins and subclavian veins. So in that, the uh, benefit is that the advantage of these lines is that they are less prone to infections because these lines, they are tunneled inside the subcutaneous tissue. So direct contact is not there of the vein with the outside environment and the risk of infections are quite less and you can stay that lines can stay for a long time, like for months, three months, four months, you can say we can put that lines safely without the risk of infection as compared to these center lines. So these are the intravenous catheters that we have talked about. Now coming to the next, another one, sorry, I will, 
This is the HD catheter. Like the same center line. These are the HD catheter. These center lines are the seven French. These are small uh, having lumen. But for the HD catheters, like for the dialysis of the patient, we do big lumen. So these catheters are around 11.5 to 12 French that mostly we are using in the ICU. These are double lumen catheters having the two lumens inside this, as you can see. Same technique, same things. Putting the needle, putting the guide wire, dilators, two dilators we are having in this along with the catheter. So using the same cell decals, just identify the vein with the ultrasound guidance. And then pricking and using the cell dingles. These are the HD catheters. The difference is that the lumen is big. These are 13 to 14 centimeter. That also 15 centimeter. So these are the catheters you are using these days and for the dialysis. So after the central lines and the other, we are for the monitoring purposes in the ICU, we are using more of the arterial lines. Arterial lines we are using as the different forms in which as the patient is in shock, you have to monitor the non-invasive blood pressure. It can't give you the exact whatever the blood pressure is going on of the patient because there are multiple factors that's affecting the patient or uh, the edimators. The oscillatory methods are not reliable as compared to the invasive methods. So for hemodynamic monitoring in a patient, the patient who is in ICU, who is on shock, who is on mechanical ventilation, Adequate monitoring is must. You can't negotiate on that. For this, we have to put a catheter, which is called the arterial catheter. These are the different arterial catheters that I'm showing you. These are the catheters that we are using in the ICU. These are the, some cannulas. Some are in the form of the cannulas. Some are in the form of the, these are the radial or femoral cannulas, or these are the femoral arterial cannulas. In which by after using the Allen's test and showing the proper under the sterilized conditions, proper painting and draping, you are putting the needle either in the radial artery in the fear or in the femoral artery. Then using the same technique, putting the uh, needle, when the patient, there is a flush of blood is coming because the arterial pressure is quite very high. By using the color of the blood, by seeing the blood pre pressures of the blood or even with the ultrasound guided, you just cannulate the artery and then put this catheter over the guide wire. So this is the artery. And then you have to connect that with the transducer's help to the monitor in which you can monitor the systolic and the diastolic BP, the mean BP. There are multiple things you can achieve. You can come to know by these arterial line waveforms that I have shown in the slides. But just showing you the catheters, this is the radial or femoral. And this is the femoral curved catheter that we are using mostly for the femoral vein cannula, femoral artery cannulation. So transducers also we are using because I will show you the transducer. This is the type of transducer that we are using the pressure monitoring kit. This is called a pressure monitoring kit in which we are using connecting one end to the monitor for the, this is the transducer this is having the pressure in which the whatever the uh, mechanical waveforms is there, the pressure waveforms of the artery that is converted to the electrical signals and with the help of the transducer, you can see the waveforms on the monitor. So these are the transducers which convert that mechanical energy of the uh, waveform to the electrical and the showing of the waveforms on the monitor. So I will show you in the detail in the slides how we are using that. So for that, as the arterial pressure is quite high, you have to keep the, for flushing of these transducers and these lines, you have to put a normal saline. Previously, it was still heparinized saline, but these days we are just putting the normal saline, making it a higher pressure system. With the 300 millimeter of the mercury, we have to, and then we have to do the flush test to flush all the clots, all the uh, bubbles, gas, everything, whatever is there, we have to remove that. Then we have to do the proper leveling of the transducer, proper zeroing of that then. And after that, only we connect the arterial lines to, with the transducers to the monitor and can see the blood pressures, can see the uh, pulse pressures, everything you can, cardiac output even you can get from these waveforms. So these are the transducers that is a high pressure system. These are the non-compliant tubings, whatever we are using these compressors, these are the pressure in the non-compliant. So the whatever the pressure is there in the artery, it will get it will not get changed with the compliance of the this uh, transducers and it will get you the accurate reading there.
So these are the transducers, the center lines, arterial lines, cannulas, these all everything we have done. So another thing, the airway in a critically ill patient is very, very important as the patients who are having traumatic brain injury, who are having strokes, who are very sick on the shock, they are not having the mental alertness. We need to put the, we need to oxygenate because their own airway, own tongue, own muscles can get obstruct the airway and can prevent, cause the hypoxia to the patients. In that cases, we have to ventilate the patient. So what are the things we need to go ahead with for the ventilation of the patient? As the patient, you have to put the masks on the face of the patient. But the patient, we have, as the patient is unconscious, they are not having the tone of the muscles and that is obstructing. So to open up the airway, even with the mask, because masks just can give you the oxygen. But to open the airway, you need some airways. That is called the nasopharyngeal airway or the oral airways. So this, this what I am showing you is the oropharyngeal airway. Yes. These all airways are color coded. They are having different colors depending upon the size. So how do you monitor, how you will, so what is the mechanism, how you will use it? Whenever you're putting the airway, it will displace the tongue to one side so that the tongue will not obstruct your patient's airway. So with these type of the airways, this is having a bite block here. So the patients will not bite the tube. So this is, can prevent the bite block. This is the outside flange that you can hold to keep the air, uh, airway. And this is the bite block. And this is the curve that is according to the human mouth curve. It is going towards the hard and soft palate. The curve is like this. And there's a distal opening here. That is, there is a hollow. This is hollow airway. There's opening here and opening here. So when you push the oxygen from here, it will displace the tongue. It will The bite block will prevent its bite block. The flange is outside the mouth. You put the mask here and from this hollow, it will displace the lung another and cause the direct air oxygen to go into the patient's larynx and the trachea. So this is in the oropharynx. From mouth to oropharynx and the posterior pharyngeal wall, this airway will help. Okay, so according to the size, you have, what size you have to use from the nose to the earlobe, you can just have to see how much is the airway we can use. There are different nasal airways. These are the soft nasal. So how to first, we will discuss this, how to use it. So initially when you have to enter, you have to put the jelly, you have to open the mouth, like the head drill, chin lift, how, the BLS maneuver that we are using to open the airway of the patient. Then you have to lubricate it well with the jelly. You have to insert it like this and then after it reaches the soft pellet or hard pellet, you have to rotate it 180 degree and then to insert it further because this curve will get fit into the mouth according to the, to the hard pellet and the soft pellet this will touch. So you have to enter it like this and then you have to rotate it 180 degree here and then to insert it after proper lubrication. The patient should be well sedated because this is a hard plastic. So it can cause injury if in the awake patients you are putting it forcefully, it can injure the mucosa and cause more bleeding and can cause more obstruction if your patient is not properly sedated or not able to is the fighting with the this thing. So this is the oropharyngeal airway. Another airway that I am showing you is the, these are the nasal airways. So there is having a round opening here that is also hollow from inside and this is the opening here. So this we can put from the anterior nasal nares to the posterior side of the nasopharynx. So this uh, also has like you are putting the mask here. So if the oral you are not able, the patient is not opening the mouth and their patient is not able, your patient is not that much sedated, they are fighting, they are not opening the mouth. So in that cases, these nasal airways will help you a lot because this can also maintain the from the nasopharynx to the oropharynx and then the larynx. So this is the anatomy. So you can, if the, your nasopharynx even is patent and it is going, the oxygen is going to the posterior pharynx, then it will go to the larynx and to, to the trachea. So these, how the, there are different sizes and this flange of the uh, nasal airways, you can buckle it with the safety pin even to the outside so that it will not migrate inside the nares. For this, first you have to lubricate it also. 
the size you can have to see from the tip of the nose to the tragus. Like this, you have to measure from the patient's this, how much is the size because different physical build of the patient depends. They are all the mostly it's the 7 to 7.5 to 8 number is mostly used for the adult males and the females. So you are putting these airways, lubrication, and then just put it like that and secured it with the safety pin or just so many bandage so that it will not migrate inside. But before that, you have to, the indication I have told you, but what is the contraindication? In which cases you should not put even this or the oral one. There are some contraindications like the basilar skull fractures or if the patient in the basilar skull fractures, the cribriform plate is not is broken. So these airways even can migrate to the from the basilar skull fractures even to the cranium and can cause more damage than the benefit. So the contraindication if the patient is having a lot of coagulopathy, bleeding. So these can you have to be very careful while putting these airways. So to maintain the pretency, first is the mask you have to put with the BLS, head, head tilt, chin lift, jaw thirst. And then if even after that for the advanced airway, we can use, if we are not able to ventilate the patient, either use the nasal airway or you can use the oral airway. After ventilating the patient, now what next we have to do? We have to put the endotracheal tube. So this is the endotracheal tube, which is cuffed. There are different, these, what are these tubes? These are the tubes that you have can put either from the mouth, mostly from the mouth, but in some cases, nasotracheal tubes are also coming. So from the mouth, you can enter the tip of the tube from the larynx to the vocal cord opening and you enter the trachea by this tip of the tube. And this connector is outside to which you can connect the ventilator circuit from here and give oxygenation, proper oxygenation to the patient. These tubes are put with the help of the laryngoscope mostly the magills, the whatever different type of laryngoscopes are coming, the curved one, the straight ones, the magills, the Macintosh. So our video laryngoscopes, there are different, different laryngoscopes that are coming. So you can use this endotracheal tubes. These are made, these are also hollow tubes because oxygen you have to give. Other features of this tube, there as this is having an opening at the distal end here with a cuff here, which you have to inflate so that it will prevent the aspiration of the things going further into the trachea. So when you inflate the cuff, there is a pilot balloon here. This is the pilot balloon, if you can see, with a string attached, which comes at the, attached to the uh, uh, endotracheal tube. So you have to inflate, there is at the tip of this balloon, there is a one-way wall. You can inflate the, it can, uh, attach a syringe here, put around 5 to 10 ml of the, uh, and inflate this cuff. So, uh, if you even put the air from here, the cuff is here, near the tip, here, I think, I hope you can see that the cuff is here. Along with, there are different black markings. There is a, these black markings, these are, like, should be at the level of the vocal cord. When you are entering, you are putting the endotracheal, in, doing the endotracheal intubation and putting the tube. So, these black markings should be at the vocal cord level and there they have written the internal diameter so there are different sizes of the tubes that you have to use mostly what in the we are just roughly idea by age by four plus four is the method you can how to but mostly in young adults like in females you are putting 7.5 to 7 and in males you can put 8 to 8.5 number tubes so these they have the markings of the centimeters different they are different so that you can see or what level should be at the lip level in which you are putting. This black mark should be inside the vocal cords. This cuff should be inflated. This is having the opening here, but if this opening get obstructed, there is another opening on the lateral side of this thing, which is called the Murphy's eye. Even if this, sometimes with the secretions or something, if this the main opening, main uh, opening of this endotracheal tube get blocked, then your ventilation will not be hampered because the, this tube has another opening called the Murphy's eye near the tip of the patient the tube from which you can give the oxygen and do the suctioning of the tubes. These days along with this, these are made of different materials, the polyvinyl chloride, the polyurethane, the silicon tubes, there are different, different materials in which these tubes are coming as these all tubes are tissue friendly, soft, according to the curvature, we have there some angled tubes are there. 
in these ways, the, the new one is the, having the subglottic suction also, in which there is a, another suction here. There's a tube here from which you can, above the cuff, this is the cuff, there's sometimes secretion of the pileup on above the cuff of the tube. From there, there is a subglottic suction in which you can just aspirate the contents above the cuff and it prevents further chances of the aspiration. So this is a more protective subglottic cuff. So these are the endotracheal tubes that we have used or another tubes that we are, these are the catheter mounts. Catheter mounts, we are using these ways to connect to the endo, with the endotracheal tube so that it will have, it is angled. It is having opening here for putting the fiber optic bronchoscopy like your intubated patients. You should know, you don't want to totally disconnect it because oxygen insufflation is must. So you can just open this port and you can enter the fiber optic bronchoscope and this is angled so that the ventilator circuit will not get torn, will not get bent or king. So this is the catheter mount that we are using along with the this endotracheal tube. This is the 15 millimeter connector of the tube that can get connected to the catheter mount and from the catheter mount, you can attach the circuit, ventilator circuit of the tube. So these are the tubes that we are using. There are different flexometallic tube coming in. It's like the patients who are ARDS patients, you want to prone the patient. In that, if you will prone with these tubes, there is more chances of kinking because you have to make the patient prone. Or in the surgical patients, like in the head and neck patients, in the traumatic brain injury, neurosurgery patients, you want to put the endotracheal, that flexometallic tubes, they are having the armored rings inside the, this. Inside this part, there is a wiring of the flexometallic uh, rings as there, which helps to patient to move or bend the tube without kinking it. So that flexometallic tubes we are mostly using for the before proning the patients. There are some other tubes coming which are called a double lumen tubes. The double lumen tubes mostly in OT they are using for the different lung surgeries. But in the from ICU point of care, the double lumen tubes they are having two lumens which are ventilating to different lungs, the left lung and the right lung. With the bronchoscopy guidance, you are entering that tube into the trachea and confirming it with the bulb bronchoscope, the adequate position. These are having the advantages like your one lung is bleeding. You don't want to soil the other lung or your one lung is having the lung abscess which gets burst and you, you don't want to uh, having this, uh, the other lungs to get infected. So the in that case, we are using double lumen tubes in which the two tubes are getting separated from each other and the one, the blood, the pus or the secretions, they are not going from one lung to another. So not you uh, in that cases we are using the double lumen tubes in the, according to the patient's need so next that we have come we are showing you the tubes are the intercostal tubes whenever you are having the pleural effusion There are different intercostal tubes that we are putting inside the pleura of the patient. The indications for putting the intercostal tubes are the pneumothorax. And when you are putting the line, sometimes the pneumothorax happened. The second, the COPD patients came with the pneumothorax. Primary pneumothorax or the secondary pneumothorax. Another is a massive pleural effusion like in the patient of malignancy or in the patient having the infections that is having the syndemonic effusions in the patient you want to drain the fluid, in that case we are putting the intercostal tubes inside the pleura of the patient with the ultrasound guidance and the other landmarks we are using for putting the tubes so that we can drain the pleural fluid, we can drain the air or the fluid and then we can show you. So this we are done, what I am showing you, this is the Cook's chest tube set, this is the heart test that in other terms we are using. Previously, we are using the trocar uh, tubes, the intercostal tubes with the help of the trocar, but they are having more chances of the injury as compared to these tubes. In the trocar tubes, for how we will see, you have to see the safe angle at the fourth to fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line, depending upon whether it's the pneumothorax or for the indication is the pleural effusion or the hemothorax, the pneumothorax. How, what is the insertion? How do you insert it? At the fourth or fifth intercostal place, we have to palpate the sternal angle. It is at the second intercostal space. You have to palpate down and to see which is the fourth and fifth intercostal space. 
and you have to feel in the mid axillary line there you have to make a neck you have to separate the skin the this is subcutaneous tissue and everything and then you have to palpate the rib at the above upper end of the rib because all the neurovascular structures these are on the lower end of the rib so you have to hit the rib and you have to trace the rib at its upper end and with the help of the trocar and pressure you have to insert it forcefully but it has the various uh, disadvantages because it can cause injury even to the underlying lung causing the leaks and the bronchopleural fistulas and it can damage the pericardium if you are putting on the left side or it can damage the heart because the force you are putting in with the trocar and the trocar is very very sharp so it can go through and through and cause more damage to the underlying structures so to prevent that these days we are using these Hall intercostal tubes or the Cook's air intercostal tubes. In this, you can see there is a needle. Here is the needle. So you can put the needle, there is the guide wire after that. So when you are putting with the ultrasound guidance or with the whatever, if your institute is having the ultrasound, it's better to visualize the things with the ultrasound first. But if not there, then you have to see the landmarks. Put the needle, aspirate, aspiration if the fluid is coming. After the you disc, after putting the needle, then from that needle, you have to put the guide wire. There is a big guide wire here along with the three dilators. One, two and three. These three dilators you have to like Seldinger technique that we are using the central line. The same we can use it for the thing. So after putting the guide wire you there, you have to dilate it, make a track and then you have to put the intercostal tube. This is having more benefit that it is not, you are not pushing forcefully any trocar. So the chances of, and you are doing it under guidance with the less force. So that risk of underlying damage to the underlying structures will be definitely less with these Seldinger's techniques rather than blindly putting that with the trocar tubes. So this is the intercostal tubes. The next one that I'm going to show you is the, this is the Foley's catheter. So this is the urinary drainage system. As the patient is on ventilator, patient is sedated, your patient is not able to, and your patient is in shock, you want to measure the urine output. The patient is in acute kidney injury, they are the, the worsening kidney functions with the metabolic acidosis. So you want to measure the uh, urine and the output of the urine. So these are the catheters. This is a polycatheter. This is having two lumens at the side back and the tip of the catheter, which is round in shape so that it will not, these are round and blunt because it will, you have to put this tube from the urethra of the patient to the bladder after putting the proper jelly and after sterilizing the area properly because these are the contaminated areas. So you have to sterilize, you have to uh, clean it well with the betadine and all. You have to put the adequate jelly, the lignocaine jelly, because these are the irritant structures that are all the foreign, these are the irritant structures. So you have to give the, put the lignocaine jelly and these blunt, this prevent the damage of the bladder mucosa or the urethral mucosa. That's why these, the tip is the blunt. You have to introduce from the urethra in the male or the female and to have inserted further so these are the two back on the back there are two ports so one is for the drainage system like you have to attach the drain of the euro bag to this port they are having written the french size whatever is there along with the how much uh, connecting the euro bag directly to this thing and there is an another port the two port the another port is for putting there is a balloon actually here at near the tip of this Holy catheter, which will get inflated in the bladder. So you have, after putting the catheter to secure it and to prevent it back, you have to put the water or the air inside the balloon system. This is the another port is to inflate the balloon, which is at the tip, so that it will get inflated and it will not get pulled out. So there are two ports here. One is to attach to the drainage system, and another is to fill the balloon, which is at the tip of the catheter this is made of polyurethane this can be for uh, because this is less toxic these are friendly to the hum human tissue and this causes less irritability so these catheters you can keep even for one or two weeks but if you want a long catheterization like the patient who are having the indication for putting the catheter is like for the patient who is having a large prostrate the patient who are 
paralytic, sedated, paralyzed, the traumatic brain injury, patients who are not conscious, the patients who are in shock, the patients who are having kidney injury. So in that case, you are putting, but in the patient who are surgical patients who are having strokes, massive strokes, who are not having the good conscious level, they want this urinary catheter for a long time. In that case, we prefer the silicon catheters. Silicon catheters, you can make them stay long. Even the antibiotic impregnated catheters are coming these days that you can use to prevent the further risk of infection to the patient from these catheters. These are having the two lumens. There are one another type of catheters, urinary catheters are coming, which is having the three lumens instead of the two lumens. The third lumen is for the irrigation of the catheter. That mostly we are using that three lumen catheters Another catheter, we can you can attach the irrigation port of the fluid with that catheter and can drain the, irrigate the bladder. Sometimes with that, mostly happens in the patient with the hematuria in which there are the tendency of making the clots in the bladder. So that can obstruct the catheter in which you need irrigation. So in that cases, you can use three lumen police catheter. And also you can use that in the intra-abdominal pressure monitoring. Like the, these are very thin structures and the bladder wall is also very thin. So if the catheter totally urinary bladder is totally drained, then the abdominal pressure is transmitted by the bladder and which can be measured by the three lumen Foley's catheter in which you can drain the fluid, uh, whole of the urine. Then you put 50 to 60 ml of the fluid from the third lumen and then you have to clamp the catheter and with the pressure transducers, you can see the intra-abdominal pressures and can manage the patient in the critical care unit according to the abdominal pressure. How it is abdominal pressure? If the patient is going into the intra-abdominal hypertension, then you have to make the measures to reduce the intra-abdominal uh, pressures so that it, the patient will not have the intra-abdominal compartment syndrome in which they will hit the uh, lungs, it will can hit the urinary kidneys and cause more damage. So to have to monitor the intra-abdominal pressures like in the surgical patients, there is a lot of bowel edema, the patients with ascites, in the patients with pancreatitis, in which you need intra-abdominal pressure monitoring to prevent the further damage to the kidneys, to the gut perfusion, to the lungs, everything you want to manage there. So for that, the three lumen Foley's catheter we are using instead of the Foley's catheter. This is only for the drainage of the urinary catheter. But the three, another lumen is there in the three uh, uh, lumen catheter, which is used for the intra-abdominal mo pressure monitoring. So another, there are some ascitic drains coming these days. The drains that we are using. So another thing that I'm showing you is the different kind of laryngoscopes that you are using. So this is the video laryngoscope. If you can use, it, you can see that there is a screen here along with the handle here. You can make it on. There is a button here. You can switch it on from here. What is the use? Like there is you have the visualization of whole of the inner side of the mouth with these kind of laryngoscopes. So normally that we are using, they are the um, Macintosh or the Magill's uh, laryngoscope in which there is a curve, but you ha they have the difficult intubation patients like those patients who are restricted mouth opening, they are having short necks, that they are having different patients in which their difficult airway is expected. Uh, you are expecting in that cases you can do use these type of video laryngoscopes. Because what is the use of this? This is a battery operated, chargeable. You can use that. And it is having a wide screen. So when you're putting these, there is a light emission from this tip. And there is a wide view of the epiglottis, glottis, and the vocal cords. And if there is a difficult intubation, you can see where is the vocal cords. And with after putting the stillet in the endotracheal tube, you can guide the tube after, with seeing the screen here, the vocal cords here. So these are, there are different, different blades are coming, like for the males, females, different blades are coming. You have to put the blades like this, and then you have to switch it on. If you will switch the light, you can see the light coming and the screen here. And you see the screen here. So you can see the vocal cords here. And after, it's the same thing you have to put inside like the there, but in those patients, like the cervical injury patients, you can't lift up the glottis that much. You can't make the position of the patient 
So in that case, is these video laryngoscopes because you can directly visualize the vocal cords here and without manipulation of the patient neck or the things, you can just put the tube up with the visualization here inside the tube. So these are very, very useful these days in the difficult intubation because this is very non-invasive. So these things, these video laryngoscope coming in the either in the Macintosh or the C-Mac or the Glidescope or the MacGrad. There are different, different of the laryngoscopes that we, you are using these days for the difficult intubation patients. And the most importantly, the fiber optic bronchoscope that is we are using these days for the difficult intubations because in that you don't need to, even the awake intubation you can do in those patients, you don't want to give the sedation in the difficult intubation because you are not sure whether you are able to ventilate the patient or you are able to intubate the patient. In that patient, you use the fiber optic bronchoscopes and you can use the awake intubation of the patient without sedation. And that is the actually very, very helpful to the clinician in protecting the airway because you can directly visualize the vocal cords. You can put that you after proper anesthetizing, putting the superior recurrent laryngeal or superior laryngeal glossopharyngeal blocks, you can put, you can anesthetize the airway with the lignocaine and then you can put the fiber optic burning, the railroading the tube above the bronchoscope, visualizing the oropharynx, the posterior pharynx, visualizing the epiglottis and going towards the vocal cords and then, then railroad that endotracheal tube the patient tolerates the procedure very well and you are very protecting the airway without, without risking that whether you are able to ventilate or you can you don't want to sedate the patient in that case is fiber optic bronchoscopy is actually very very beneficial so another thing that i am going to show you next is the so the pluribac system i have not shown here that we will show in the slides the another one tube that I want to show you is the, so this is the Muji or you can say the, another the Cook's airway exchange catheter. Airway exchange catheter, these are the long catheters with a hollow tube inside it and there's a connector here because you can see there's a connector here from which you can give the oxygen with the these are small lumen tubes, but these are long, around 50 to 100 centimeter tubes that you can put. If you are doing the intubation, you are not able to visualize the property. You are not able to put the tube inside. In that, you can use these bougies or these airway exchange catheters. You can put over, above them in the fiber optic bronchoscope. You can put over that and under the vision, you can put that into the vocal cords and then railroad the uh, endotracheal tubes over there. So these airway exchange catheters, even if your tube is, you want to exchange the tubes, your cuff of the tube is broken, you, the patient is having difficult airway, you don't want to do again the laryngoscopy and to visualize, take out the tube and take the risk. In that cases, you just from the previous endotracheal tube, put this airway exchange catheter, put oxygen on the behind of this thing, and then take out the previous tube and above that, put the another tube with the oxygen so in supplication going on as the distal end is you can connect to the oxygen port and you can oxygenate the patient prevent the hypoxia exchange the tube if the patient tube is broken if the cuff is broken if the patient has bite, bite the tube and it's deformed in that cases you can use this airway exchange catheter there so these are the various tubes i have shown you virtually but now i'm going to show you my slides just a second so now i am showing you all the slides that tubes that i have shown you in the various slides and the discuss further whatever i have not shown you the pluribac systems, the fiber optic bronchoscopes, the IABP, the TPI, the different, different lines that left that we are going to use that. I'm going to show you that now. So this is the rise tube that I have already, the different color markings I have shown you, the different color markings. The 14 gauge is the green one that I have shown you, the 16 gauge, 18 gauge, the drainage port with the lock, the having the lateral eyes and with the radio opaque line inside it so that even in the excess you can confirm the position on the gas in the 
stomach and you can see the position it's not kinking it's not going to the bronchus tubes you can confirm it so it's having the radio awake line it's kink resistant so this is the rise tube that i have already shown how to insert it see that how measure the how to uh, size of the tube and lubricate it and then put it through on the mouth it is going to the esophagus till the stomach and drain the gastric contents so purpose we have already another one is the fracas tube Sometimes these tubes, the rice tubes are so soft that they are not getting inside the stomach. They are getting kinked or they are getting coiled inside the mouth itself. In that difficult patients in which you are not able to put the normal rice tube, we putting the freca tube. This is having the advantage that it is having a stillet or the guide bar inside which make it quite this lumen. It's, it's quite hard and you can put it by the, if the patient that not able to swallow so these patients, these tubes, Preca tubes, having the advantage of less coiling up because this is having the guide wire. And after putting the tube, you can confirm the position with an X-ray, putting the guide wire, taking out a little bit of the guide wire and then seeing that the how it is a position. So in that patient's Preca tube is quite beneficial as compared to the other rice tube. So this is the tube I have shown you. Nasogestional, like in the pancreatitis patients, in the patient who are having high gastric residual volume. In that, there is a tip of the patient, there is a radiopic markers and the decompression holes. If the one, the tip is getting blocked or something, you have the holes on the side. There is a ports for the gastric decompression to taking out the gastric juices and the jejunal feed port in which you can give the feed to the jejunum of the patient. Different, different sizes, different materials, polyurethane, silicon, different length. These tubes are quite more length as compared to the rails tube. The rails tube length is mostly 75 to 80 centimeter. But these tubes, because they have to travel a long distance as compared to the nasogastric or the orogastric tubes. So these are having approximate length of 130 centimeter. So that it can reach the fluoroscopy guided. You have to put this tube till the jejunum and then to feed the patient. So another tube that I'm going to discuss is the Sangstick and Blackmore tube. Like in mostly CLD, chronic liver disease patients who are having the upper GI bleed patients with having variceal bleeding, in that patients, you have to put this tube. This tube is having two balloons. One is the esophageal balloon and another is the gastric balloon. And there's having diff three different ports at the end. One is the gastric balloon, another esophageal balloon, and the third is for the gastric aspiration. So these, the patients who are bleeding a lot, you have to give a tamponade effect so that the bleeding will get reduced till your gastroenterologist will come to the ICU for shifting the machine. The patient is bleeding profusely. So the patient is going to shock. To prevent that bleeding, you have to use this sangstick and tube. This has to be put from the mouth with, uh, with the under the sometimes with the laryngoscope. First, you have to freeze this patient tube so that to make it hard. Otherwise, it gets coiled up even in the mouth itself. So you have to make it hard by freezing it and then putting the jelly and all and putting blindly into the mouth. You have to uh, use sometimes the laryngoscope or you have to protect the airway first definitely by the intubation and then to put the tube because the upper GI bleed patients have the tendency to aspirate the blood. So for, after intubating the patients, you have to put with the laryngoscope and the magus enter the tube and then push the tube. They're having two lumens, the gastric balloon and the esophageal balloon. Most cases you have to, after putting the tube, after adequately going inside, then you have to first inflate the gastric balloon approximately volume of 250 to 400 ml of the volume because the gas is a capacity. When it gets inflated, it will cause a tamponade effect. Their gastric aspiration port, you, as you can see beyond at the distal part, you can see the gastric aspiration opening. So after inflating the tube, whatever the blood is getting collected, you can aspirate by the gastric aspiration port. And after that, sometimes you don't, if the, there is a gastric varices, then it will get caused the tamponade and the bleed is not there. But sometimes there is an esophageal varices. You are not sure because you have not done the endoscopy. So in that cases, the esophageal balloon, you have to inflate that balloon with the esophageal balloon port, insert around the 40 to 50 millimeter uh, ml of the air and to 40 millimeter of the pressure you have to maintain to inflate the esophageal balloon. There are different length markings on this. And then you have to pull it back with the and to uh, one kg of the weight you have to, so that it will get stuck on the gastroesophageal junction. It will not get displaced till your gastroenterologist is coming and then doing the endoscopy. And to prevent the patient from profuse bleeding and to prevent the patient going to the shock, 
this tube is quite beneficial to the clinicians in mostly in the varicel bleeding in the upper GI bleed patients. That patient, that tube is having three lumens, the gastric, three ports, gastric port, uh, gastric aspiration and esophageal. This is the Minosta tube, which is also used for the upper, it's having the same, the esophageal and the gastric balloons, but it is having the four ports along with the extra esophageal aspiration port. So next line that I'm going to discuss is the EVD drains that mostly we are using in the traumatic brain injuries or in the intracranial hemorrhages in the patients who are having hydrocephalus, in the patients who are having high intracranial pressures. In that, we have to put a tube in the, ex in the lateral ventricle uh, of the patient and to um, connect it to the outside collecting chamber to reduce the pressures of the brain so that the patient will not, brain will not get herniated on the non-communicating hydrocephalus. There are many indications of putting that tube. So in this tube, in this picture that I will show you, there's a lateral ventricle in which you have put the EVD drain. After that, there is the pressure setting for the drainage of CSF. Mostly 10 to 15 ml of CSF you can drain per hour. And there is a collection chamber, which is we have to zeroing uh, horizontally, the level of the tragus of the air. So you have to zeroing is very important because to negate the pressure of the atmospheric pressure, you have to, because there is always a tendency in all the, even the, uh, central lines or the arterial lines, you have to do the leveling and the zeroing. That is must if you are using the monitoring purposes because these it can also be used to the intracranial pressure monitoring also. So this is a temporary drainage of the CSF from the lateral ventricles to a closed collection system outside the body. At what point you have to do? So you have to see the coronal sutures. These are the, the horizontal coronal sutures. This is 3 cm up proximal to the coronal suture and uh, one centimeter proximal to the coronal suture and three centimeter lateral to the midline or the interpupillary line. You have to see that you have to enter the needle in that lateral ventricle and then you have to drain it. So this is the insertion that I have shown in different diagrams. With the coronal sutures, you have to identify the three cent one centimeter up beyond that. You have to see the coaches point mostly we are used to aiming. This diagram is showing, so this is the, from nasion, 11 to 12 centimeter behind that, 3 centimeter off the midline and the interpupillary line in the point at which the interpupillary line and the 3 centimeter off from the, behind the nasion, that point you have to aim the catheter towards the medial canthus, that is approximately 1 to 2 centimeter anterior to the coronal sutures. In that, you have to enter the lateral ventricle, you have to drain the system, and you have to the positioning the system at the level of the triggers. The zeroing should be at the level of the triggers. So endotracheal tube that I have already shown you, the standard 15 millimeter connector. This is the subglottic suction I was talking about. This is having the subglottic way where you can take the whatever the secretions get piled up above the cuff of the tube. In the cuff tube, you can take it aspirate from the pilot uh, the subglottic suctioning port. Another the pilot Dr. balloon. Just use the mouse to point out if you need. No, point out with the mouse arrow, whatever you need, if you need to point out. Okay, sir. Now you can see, sir. So this is the connector. So this is the subglottic suctioning. You can see, sir, now. Yeah. Good. Okay, this is a subglottic suctioning port that you can use. This is the pilot balloon from which you can inflate and the cuff is getting at the distal end of the tube. So there's a opening here. One is the Murphy's eye here. The lateral eye I have already discussed. There's a cuff there. This is a transparent PVC tube. If you will do the cut section of the cross section of the tube, it is like that in which there is the cuff balloon lumen, the internal diameter of the tube. There is an opening here and here is the suction lumen. So this is the normal endotracheal tube we are using. The, already we have discussed the mechanical ventilation, resuscitation during uh, diphtheria or edema, laryngeal edema you can use. These are the flexometallic tubes I was discussing because it's having metallic rings that will prevent the kinking of the tubes if you have to change the position in the prone position or the lateral positions or the surgeries in the prone, this flexometallic tube is used. So the airways we have already discussed from the nasal tip of the nose to the tragus. You have to measure the length. These are the soft, pliable, not causing injury, opening the nasopharynx, and you are able to ventilate the patient. So this is a giddle airway. This is a wide block. 
So this is the flange, outer flange, which you are outside the mouth to hold it. This is the bite block that prevents the biting of the patient teeth by the teeth of the patient. This is the curve that is actually uh, using as the hard and soft palate, the kink resistant curve, so that it push the tongue away and of epiglottis forward, keeping the epiglottis off from the posterior pharyngeal wall. So because it's going from the anterior mouth to the posterior pharyngeal wall, so it keeps the tongue away from that and its tapered edges is to reduce the direct trauma to the mucosa. Color coding that we have already shown you, different, different colors for the different sizes is there so from the pediatric to the neonatal to the adult, male, female. So these are the various sizes. How much is the length of the Goodell airways? The method, how to use it, you have to put with the airway tip, when the tip of the airway point up and then you have to insert and then you have to rotate to 180 degree like this and then to enter the further. Video laryngoscope, we have shown there's a battery here. The tip of this having the light source which is emitting and you can directly visualize without manipulating like without uh, the patient is having cervical injury, difficult airway, you can't use that. In that patient, you are using that for video laryngoscope. So you can use, you can put the laryngoscope as usual and you can visualize the full, the wide area of with the this. These are the different kind of laryngoscopes holding pediatric sides and different blades are coming of the different uh, according to the whether you are uh, doing intubation in the large adult or the pediatric or the near. So this is the fiber optic main bronchoscope that we are using these days basically in the ICU in the difficult airway patients or for bronchoscopies or for suctioning in the patients who are having muc increased secretions, the mucus plugging causing collapses of the lung. The bronchoscope can be used to even open up the collapse, take out the secretions, take out the foreign bodies. So these are very, very beneficial in the, to the as intensivist. So... Here is the eyepiece of the patient in which you can either visualize the whatever. This is the tip of the fiber optic bronchoscope. The light is emitting from this and there is a camera here. If you can see the cross section, there is a light guide here. There is a lens here from which you can see and there is a channel outlet. There will be, and there is, you can do the suctioning of the secretions also. So if you will do the cross section of the tip, it will look like this. It is actually having four ports, four lumens, one for the light, one for the lens, one for the outlet and one for the suction. So this is the, having different markings. This is the totally insertion tubes. Here, there are many openings. One is to the IP so that you can visualize it or you can connect it to the camera and see the, on the big screen also. There's a channel port. There's a suction here, tubing attached at one port here. And there's a light source that is used. You can use, put the light here. There's a different batteries or charge which is coming. So these all are there. I can show you here in the another one. So this is a suction port in which you can attach. The, this is the catheter insertion channel. You can want to flush the things or you want to give medications to the, the patient or you want to take the biopsy from the lung tissue. You can do from there. This is the camera or the head in which you can either directly see from the eyepiece or connect it to, with the wire to the screen in which you, you can visualize the vocal cords and everything on the big screen. This is the light. There was the light source. So this, there is an extension and flexion control of the working tip. The tip is getting extension or flexion if you can, you put the thumb here and move the things. So it's just like driving a car. You have to enter the fiber optic bronchoscope. So you have to sit, stand on the patient's head and on the back of the patient's head and enter the scope through the mouth after proper anesthetizing with the nebulizations of the lignocaine and putting the uh, superior laryngeal nerve, glossopharyngeal nerve blocks you have to put to, to anesthetize the airway. You have to put this tube from here, enter here. From here, doing the suctioning, whatever the secretions are coming in, you can suction from here. And the movement of the tip with the flexion and extension of the tip, you can go to the different, different lobes of the record in the X-ray or in the CT, which lobe is collapsed. You want to open the specific lobe for that direction these flexion extension working tip is there so this is very very beneficial to the clinicians these days in the icu uses we have done that biopsy the aspiration of the secretions or in the difficult intubations direct visualization of the vocal cords aspiration of the retained secretions bleeding if it's there then you can control it in the patients or the therapies also so you can give from there so as i have told you stand on the head end and to visualize it 
airway exchange gases we have shown hollow tubes big long tubes oxygen insufflation ports are there airway exchange you can put give you can put the tube put the ex airway exchange take out the first tube put the new tube over that so it's, you can do the airway exchange catheters with the help of this you can change the tubes supraglottic airway devices in the patients of the difficult airways who are you are not able to ventilate with the mask even after putting the either the nasopharyngeal or the oropharyngeal airways you can use the blindly these supraglottic airways these have the benefit of getting this aperture bars is there there is a big aperture here with the cuff there so you inflate the cuff with this pilot balloon this will get make a seal around the glottis of the chest and whatever air you can push after putting the circuit and oxygen here so it will go directly to the above this is above the glottis that's why it's called a supraglottic air which in which you are not able to ventilate you are not able to intubate so these are the uh, devices that actually help to maintain the oxygenation of the patient in the difficult situations so this is that airway tube. You just connect the ventilator circuit here at the millimeter connector and insufflate with the oxygen. So this will this will get thick, snuck to the glot above the glottis and just push the air oxygen inside till the point you are able to arrange the things or do that. Even in the uh, ACLS algorithm, if you can see, they have not uh, put effort on the intubation. If you are having the difficult airway or if the patient is not getting ventilated, even LMAs is sufficient. But this classic or the LMAs is having the disadvantage that it can insufflate the stomach also and the things can aspirate further because you are not inside the vocal cords. It's just above the glottis. So the both of openings are there. And if you push a lot of air, it will get, the patient can get aspirated. So to prevent this, there how to insert, there to prevent this, there is a, different type of the LMAs that are coming that is having a tip at their tip there is a drain tube from which you can put the Riles tube and you can aspirate the gastric contents from here itself you can put these how to put these supraglottic airways is I have shown you first you have to put your fingers it's just hold like a pen you have to insert lubricate it very well with the jelly and to put the hold it like this entering the mouth of the patient and with the two fingers just another finger you have to insert inside the mouth till as much as possible you can go inside and then you have to inflate it connect to the connector and to the circuit so there are different different of the different type of the lms that these days are coming these are the lms supreme which is having the bite block to prevent it there is a gastric suction port is there Pre-curved is there. There's a cuff is having the molded fine protect airway from the epiglottic obstruction. This is the elliptical airway tube, which is there. Ambu is there in which you, this this is having the helpful that if they're not able to uh, intubate the patients, you just put this over the fiber optic bronchoscope like this and you can, with the fiber optic bronchoscope, enter the vocal cord and then just push this LMA above that. So you can use this as a Ventilation also and for putting this is the eye gel LMA is having the gastric port, the gastric channel, the bite block so that it will not get patient's teeth will not get the buccal cavity stabilizer is there. Here is the epiglottic rest. This reduces the downfolding of the epiglottis and this cuff is there which makes a gel like material. That's why it's called the eye gel which makes the insertion easier and reducing the further trauma. So this is the combi tubes that we are using. Sometimes you are not able to ventilate the patient, you are not able to intubate the patient. So these are the tubes in which you just blindly putting these tubes. This is having two cuffs. One is the distal cuff, another is the proximal cuff. So this is the distal cuff which blocks the esophageal and it reduces the gastric ventilation. So whatever you are giving the oxygen or there, you are drawn, don't know whether you are giving the oxygen to the uh, trachea or the airway or towards the gastric port. So this after inflating this balloon, you just block the gastric outlet and it will not further over distend the stomach, prevents the risk of aspiration. And this is the proximal curve, which is in the blocks the oro and nasal pharynx and it stabilizes. And there are these, the, here are the ventilation ports, holes from which the, so gastric you have blocked from here, nasal and air pharynx, so it will not leak back here. So whatever oxygen you have given from the tube, it will go to, the, from the lateral channels, it will go to the trachea and achieve the oxygenation of the patient. So there are different teeth marks here, pilot balloon, inflation line, the connector and the drain tube for the gastric catheter also is there. So this is very, very beneficial in the difficult airway in which you are not able to ventilate, not able to intubate. So these tubes are 
quite beneficial because they just put blindly in that tube, inflate the, both the cuffs, aspirate the gastric contents from the catheter and ventilate the patient for as long till you are calling for the help or calling for the tracheostomy or further things. Another is, is the AMBU bag. This is the AMBU bag, which is we are using for ventilating the patients in the ICU. We are having C-circuits. We are having the ventilator circuits. But in the emergency situations, you can just connect the oxygen. So there's a mask here. And there's a one-sided one-sided wall here in which you can give whatever the oxygen is in situation. This volume is approximately 250 to 400, depending upon the sizes of the uh, AMBU bag. In the pediatric, it's lower in the above. There is an oxygen inlet tubing here in which you can insufflate the oxygen. There is a reservoir bag. If you want to give the high FiO to the patient, patient's lungs are very bad. You can insufflate this reservoir bag with the oxygen first. So it will give high FiO to the patient. There are release valves. Sometimes it gets stuck. The increased pressures. So the release valves are there. This is the bag. The volume of the bag is 250 to 500 ml according to the size. If the patient's lung is very bad, patient is in bad ARDS, so while transporting, you want to use this. There is a PEEP valve also these days coming in these, in which you can close it and you can actually give the PEEP to the patient to prevent the lung collapses and to proper for the proper oxygenation. The, this is all the oxygen coming from there to the mass to the patient and there is an expiratory valve here itself so that here on the oxygen will not get mixed up with the expiratory. So just outside the mask, the expiratory valve to take out the carbon dioxide and from here reservoir, the oxygen will get mixed, air and oxygen get mixed here and then you can give to the patient. IV cannulas we have already. So these are the color coding of the cannulas, the different colors and what is the flow volume per minute of the patient. So if the patient is in shock, you have to put a big gauge cannula like orange or the gray cannula of the 14 or 16 gauge in which there is a flow of approximately 240 ml. We have the 500 ml saline. So one liter of saline you can give only in four minutes that much of even the central lines are not having that much of the big lumen that can resuscitate the patient more efficiently as compared to. So these are the, because these are having short lumen and the big, uh, short length and the big lumen, the flow rate is actually high in these cannulas. But the difference is the patients who are in shock, the peripheral veins are collapsed. So in that there is a difficulty in which you have to put the central line. Otherwise, these are the color coding. These are the gauges of the various IV cannulas. And these are very important. How much of the fluid you can give to a patient in one minute and you can resuscitate the patient. These are the tracheostomy tubes. Mostly if the patient is for long ventilation, patient is in the ICU, the stroke patients, the patient who are not very traumatic brain injury patients, the patients who are very sick, will, they, we have to use the tracheostomy tubes. These days we are doing the percutaneous tracheostomies in the uh, ICUs at the bedside of the patient. We are. This is a tracheostomy tube that I am showing. So this is having a connector here, you in which you can connect this to the ventilator circuit. So this is a tape attachment. You can attach the um, bandage or something. The holders from here. This is the flange. This is the shaft of the trachea, and this is the cuff. Like the endotracheal tube was having the cuff. The same we have to use for the prevent the aspiration the pilot balloon in which you have to inflate the one way only. So the inflation tube which inflates the cuff and this is a distal. The, the sm this is a small tube as compared to the endotracheal tubes and that's why these have decreased the work of breathing. The dead space of the patient will get reduced with these kind. And these can stay for the long time in the patient as compared to the endotracheal tubes. There are different types of the fenestrated TV tubes are there as you can see. Here is the fenestration, the hole is there and these are coming with the different cannulas. You can take out the inner cannula, you can clean this. The fenestrated tube is having the benefit that the patient you can, patient is able to speak even with these fenestrated tubes because when the uh, patient is uh, better, but the, for air protection, you can just deflate and you can make the patient with the fenestrations, the air can come out and the patient even can speak with these type of the tracheostomy tubes. Central uh, venous catheters we have already discussed. There are three ports, three lumens, the proximal port, the distal lumen, and the medial port. And there is a proximal, there are the openings for the intravenous fluids, for the medications, for the vasopressors, 15 centimeter long, PVC tubes. So 10 ml per second maximum flow through the proximal and 5 ml through the distal ports. So there is a difference because these are of the 
It engaged in the distal port, which is showing, getting opened just at the tip. It is having high gauze, so it's having a high uh, flow rate. So that there are different uh, markings on the this we have seen. There is a five centimeter markings. There is the total length is approximately fifteen centimeter of theirs. But you can see the one five centimeter, ten and fifteen centimeter markings. One one centimeter. This is the flange. You can um, suture the patient with the hold of the central line is there. Ultrasound guidance is definitely for the these days with not the blind ones. So this is the, if you will see the cross section of the tube, this is like this. Two ports are of 18 gauge and another is of 16 page. This is the distal one that is going to give the vasopressors or the fluid resuscitation. And these actually in this lumen, there are three lumens ongoing. This 15 centimeter is having three lumens with three ports. So this is the actually tray that having different, different needles, Seldinger's technique, the dilators, the guide wire I have shown here. CVP part, the, the kits that I have shown that is included all these things. The tunnel catheter we have, I have already told you that is in, that is there is some distance of the skin. The catheter is tunneled inside the skin so that the risk of infection and for the prolonged stay, these are the, this is the distance that is under the skin and from here they have entered the vein from the internal jugular vein that is going to the right atrium and right basically this the tip of the central venous catheter should be at the junction of the superior vena cava with the right atrium and if you can want to see in the x-ray that confirm the tip it should be at the above the two to three centimeters above the carina of the patient so that is the place where you have to see the this so this is the tunnel catheter this is the metal tunneler that we can I will show you. This is the matter to make the subcutaneous tunnel. So this is the uh, some part of the catheter from this ring to this ring. There is a, some. This is the part of the catheter that will lie under the skin, and this is the part that which will go inside the vein of the. So this skin part, the tunneling part, that prevents the further infection and keeps these catheters for long stay inside the patient. The Hickman catheter we have already discussed. The arterial line, the needle, and there is a bevel on the needle. You have to put the guide wire, then the catheter inside the arterial line. So these are the arterial cannulas or lines which we are using these days. So this, this setup is very important. You have to connect the arterial line with the saline field. This is the bag. I was 300 millimeter of the pressure, the high pressure bags, which you have to transducers. You have to, because these have to change the signals from the mechanical signals to the electrical signals by producing the waveforms on your monitor. So this whole connection is transducers. You can you, you visualize and you can see the waveforms and uh, the hemodynamic monitoring and even for the pulse pressure variation or the even some uh, other monitors are there that can give you the output, even the cardiac output, you can stroke volume also. All the parameters you can drive. I will not go into the detail because that is a very different topic from this. So these are the various waveforms that you are seeing. The systolic, the dichrotic notch, the diastolic phase. So under damped, over damped, you have to see by the flush test. There are different conditions in which the waveforms get over damped in different conditions under damped. So this is the whole setup. Uh, putting the arterial cannula, connecting it to the transducer for flushing and all we have the 300 millimeter of the pressure and the transducer is getting connected to the monitor which you can see the waveforms so the x actually the phlebostatic axis is the axis in which you have to do the zeroing you have to do the leveling so this all is a different topic that we have to use Yes. These are the trocar intercostal tubes I have shown. They're having different, different eyes, different markings here. There's a patient, the tip is trocar is there and you have to push this. But these days, these are not using, we are more using the Cooks or the Thal intercostal tubes. These are the markings in which you have to put 20 centimeter according to the, the lumen and the markings you have to mention. Here is the size or 28 French and this is the 28 French they're written on this because if you have to drain only the pneumothorax you can use the small gauge catheters but if you have to drain the pleural effusions or the hemothorax you wear the big gauge because these tubes the the small gauge or air can uh, you can take out the air but not the fluids the thick fluids the empyema in that cases you have to choose big lumen big French tubes so that it can drain the fluid thick fluid well so this is very important. The pleural uh, 
uh, effusions or the pneumothorax when you're putting the intercostal tubes, how you will drain it. So initially there are one bottle or the two bottles, but these days either we are using these three bottles or we are using the pluribag systems. So how do we use this? Here the tube is coming from the intercostal tube. You are connecting directly to this thing. So this is just the drainage bottle. Whatever is coming, the air or the fluid that is drained into the this. There is no water seal here, you have to see. So this the second bottle is actually the water seal. Why you want the water seal in this? Because our intrathoracic cavity is having the negative pressures. So if you are not, these tubes are not inside the negative uh, pressure, then the outside air can go to the patient's chest. So to prevent that, we have to give the water seal systems here. In which the tip of the tube you have to submerge in the water around 2 cm from the mostly 100 ml of water or 2 cm of the tip should be submerged in the water so that the environmental air should not go inside. So this will have the drainage system. The water and uh, air come from here, get collected here. Then the for actually the uh, this is the water seal system. But if the, you are not able to drain whole of the hemothorax, like Sometimes you have to put the negative pressure from given suction pressure you have to given from outside to drain the air or oxygen very well. So this is the third bottle in which you have to connect the suction port and to drain the catheter uh, suction, putting the negative pressure here to drain the pneumothorax. So this three bottle system is the ideal thing that we are using in the ICUs these days. The initially the one bottle or the two bottle we are using. So this is the one bottle, but the disadvantage of that that the water, the blood or the fluid get collected and this height when it increases, it increases the water seal and it causes more resistance. And because of that resistance, whole of the fluid will not get drained. So this can be remanaged with these three bottle systems these days. This is the pluribag system. These are the pluribags we are using these days, the collection bottles in which there is a markings of how much fluid and how much there's a water air leak monitor here the suction catheter here this we can put the suction here and you can give the negative pressure from here you just have to put the intercostal tube here to the patient it will collect the fluid it will be the water seal here and it they put the suction so all the three things instead of the three bottles you can combine all the three things in this pluribank systems so i have shown you this thing so from the patient, here is the blood or fluid drain from the patient get collected. There is the fluid drainage systems in which, but from here you can see here the holes are going here. So from here, if you can see, these are the water seal chamber here. Here you have to fill the water and this is the water seal that you're giving. And from here you can give the, put the suction on 10 to 20 centimeters so that the, the resistant pneumothorax you can manage with. These pluribag systems better as compared to the water systems. So first water from the clamp patient, first from drainage, second is for the water seal and third is for the suction. Anatomy, I have shown you the fourth to fifth intercostal space. At the, there is a safe triangle here with the base of the axilla with the latissimus dorsi on the one side and the pectoralis major. You have to palpate fourth to fifth intercostal space, infiltrate with the local anesthetic and at the upper edge of the rib, you have to introduce the intercostal tube. This is the thal system that I have shown you with the three dilators and using the Seldinger's technique, which causes less trauma to the underlying lung that we have already discussed. I have already shown this to you. Just a diagram. So these are the intercostal tubes. Another is the swan gans catheter or the PA catheters that we are using these days. This is a one cent, one ten centimeter long yellow tube that you are coming these days. We are. This is very beneficial initially. In the right sided of the heart pressures, if the patient is having the right heart failure, the cardiac, uh, cardiogenic shock. But after the Pacman study, the use of these catheters are now getting less and less, but not in the septic shock. These the catheters are not useful, but mostly useful even now these days itself in the OT cardiac surgeries and all. These are having very, very uh, long tubing of the 110 centimeter with the 7.5 French. There is a balloon at the tip of the catheter with the five lumens here. As you can see the five lumens, the one, the red one is the for the balloon inflation. The balloon is at the tip. There is 1.5 ml of the capacity of this balloon. You can just, there is a pre-filled syringes there only of 1.5 ml you can use connect here so that it will not get over inflated and get burst. So there are three ports here. 
One is the proximal fold that is around 30 to 31 cent 30 centimeter from the uh, tip of the thing in which you can you know, give the fluids, fluid resuscitation or the intervals. There is an another port that is called the R infusion port in which you can, that is around 30 centimeter. This is around 31 centimeter from the proximal port. But this is the main important, the PA distal port. This is at the tip of the, this is the distal part of the PA catheter with the tip having the balloon here. So when you introduce it, you have to just put it like the central vein. You have to uh, cannulate the central vein. You have to put the sheath. You have to put the introducer. And then from inside the sheath, you have to put the catheter slowly and slowly and connect the distal port with the, uh, the, the thermistor port is also there. When you are going inside, you have to connect and see the various change in the temperature uh, pressures of the system. As you, see, you can see, if you will enter, I will see. So from here, central venous, you can get the superior vena cava and you will see the right heart. When you enter the right atrium, the pressures of the right heart will be displayed on the waveforms. It's the 0 to 8 millimeter. From the right atrium, when you enter the right ventricle, the systolic pressure will increase from 8 to 15 to 25. But the diastolic pressure is the same as that of the right atrium. So increase in the systolic waveform of when you reach the right ventricle, you recognize that you have reached the right ventricle. So from right ventricle, now that if you have to go to the pulmonary artery here, if you're going to the pulmonary artery, the systolic pressure is remains the same of the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. But have you seen the diastolic pressure from, if you will travel from, the PA catheter will travel from the right ventricle to the pulmonary catheter, that there is a rise in the diastolic pressure from which you can appreciate that your tip of the catheter now reached the pulmonary artery here. So what type of waveform? So see that this time, the right is 0 to 5 or 0 to 7 millimeter of, when you reaches the right ventricle, the systolic pressure is increased, but the diastolic is the same as of the right atrium. And when you reach the pulmonary artery, now the systolic pressure is the same, the diastolic pressure has increased. That makes you appreciate that now you have reached the pulmonary artery. Here you have to inflate the balloon and after the capillary wedge, you can get the pulmonary artery wedge pressure, which is almost the same as the left atrium and the left atrial pressure you can say that it without the uh, it's coordinating with the left ventricle so indirectly you are getting the left ventricle pressure so this is the main purpose and the main how to insert it how to reach it and there is a thermistor port here which will help with the thermodilution techniques you can even monitor the cardiac output of the patient you can see the uh, uh, a lot of things use it, the systemic vascular resistance, a lot of derivatives you can derive with using the Swans Gans catheter, especially in the right side of the heart failure, especially in the other cardiac surgeries, cardiogenic shocks, these, these catheters are very, very useful. So the drains, the situs drains that we are, a lot of drains we are using. These are the, the tip is quite curved of these drains. These are using the Saldinger's technique enter the peritoneal cavity here, put the uh, guide where, then dilate it and then, then put the catheter and just attach it to the collecting bag. So these are the various strains that we are using. This is the how it, the packaging is coming with the syringe, the curved tip sometimes that you have to put the guide by and just straighten it and this is the catheter. So these are the ascitic drain or sometimes you can put them in with the negative pressure even in the plural also here. Polys we have already already the balloon port which is color coded for the different sizes and this is a urine drainage plate. This is the cuff I was discussing that the balloon is there that is help to float the catheter tip inside the bladder of the ball. You have to inflate here with the water or the air and then this will get inflated and this will make the prevent the police from pulling away. So there are the these are the uh, three channel catheters as I have discussed for the intra-abdominal pressure monitoring. This is for the air inlet for inflating the catheter here. This is the flushing medium. And here is the inlet for the flushing medium. And this is the drainage of the urine and all. So this is for the catheter inflation. This is for the drainage. And this is for the, the third, like in next diagram I have shown you. So this is the bladder. Here is the foley. This is the three-way lumen is connected to the three catheters. One is the urine drainage that is going on already 
here for the intra-abdominal pressure monitoring, you have to insert, you have to insert 60 ml of the saline inside the foleys and then to clamp it. And then with the help of the pressure monitoring, you can measure the intra-abdominal pressure of the patient in the patients in pancreatitis, bowel surgeries, bowel edemas, ascites. If the urine output is getting less, you want to diagnose whether the patient is not going to the intra-abdominal compartment syndrome. In that patient, the intra-abdominal pressure monitoring, this three-way human folies is quite very helpful. So next, the things that we are using is the transvenous pacemakers. These are having the leads with the generator is here. Then this generator, there are three knobs. One is of the rate in which you have to, in the patient who is having bradycardia, in patients who are having second degree heart blocks, complete heart blocks, the patient who is having ongoing CPR in which you want the patient who is going to bradycardia, in that patient for the temporary uh, stabilization of the patient, you have to put the pacemakers. There are three different types, mostly the epicardial, the uh, transvenous is there, and the, and the transcutaneous, the transcutaneous pads you have already seen in the defibrillator or the, that machine. You just put the pads above the chest, one at the left side of the uh, zipoid process, another on the back, just down the scapula and the epicardial and the uh, transcutaneous pacing you can do through uh, till the patient is stabilized. Or you can put the from the internal jugular vein, you can put these wires that will go to the right atrium or to the right ventricle and you can just connect these wires with this generator Putting, giving, there are three. One is the rate, which gives you the rate, like the intrinsic, what is the intrinsic rate of the patient? Like it's, if it's 30, 40, you have to keep that rate up. This machine's rates up beyond, above that patient's rate so that it can give the adequate cardiac output with that contractility. Another is the milliampere that the output is there. The how much electric current or the electric impulse you have to give in so that your heart will get contract that is by the this another second knob that is showing the how much of the output is there and the third is the sensitivity or the sense threshold of the patient that how much sensitive is the heart for the depolarization after getting the current so this third knob is for that there so this is the wire that we are using putting from the internal jugular vein putting the sheath introducer and then you enter from this from the internal jugular vein to the RA and then RV and then you're connecting these uh, leads to the generator here and giving the impulse so that your heart gets stimulated and so this is the thing so this is the diagram in which we have seen this is the permanent pacemaker or you can see the pacemaker in the skin so there are leads are going from here as you can see the SA node is in the right atrium so one lead is going to the uh, right atrium, another lead, lead is going to the apex of the right ventricle. So these leads from outside you can attach to the generator. These can send the impulses, these can send the various chambers, sense the electric impulse they, uh, and capture that pulse and causes the depolarization and produces the cardiac output. So these uh, pacing techniques are very beneficial. See, I've already shown you First is for the rate, how much you want to set the rate for the uh, for depolarization. Second is the electric impulse, how much you have to give. And third is the sensitivity threshold, which the, the myocardium or the endocardium is, captures at which threshold it captures and causes the depolarization. So these three settings you have to put and the wires you have to attach to the generator here. And these are the wires where you can either from the subclavian or from the IJV or from the femoral. These will go to the right atrium or right ventricle. Depending upon you are pacing the atria, ventricle or it's a single lead or the dual, there are different, different codes that is there. The first is the chambers. There's, if you will ask that this is the American Society of Pacing of Electrophysiological Codes in for the bradycardia in which there are five columns first is for the which chamber you are pacing like you're uh, pacing atria ventricle which chamber is getting sensed is the atria is getting sensed the ventricles are getting sensed or both are getting sensed and the third is for the response whether you are triggering it or you are inhibiting it or your, your device is doing both the things so if i mean for example if you are putting the uh, first paced rhythm in the atria and the uh, second lead in the ventricle so 
first there is a sensing whether the heart is contracting or depolarization is occurring or not. If the senses show that it is not, then this chamber is getting paced by the electric impulse. So whether it's inhibiting like the patient is having the bradycardia, you have to trigger it or inhibit it if the intrinsic activity is there. Even this device is having the inhibition that it should not send the depolarization impulse or the electric impulse for the depolarization. So this is very, very important for the transvenous pacing. Next that we are discussing is the IABP balloon. This is the IABP balloon that we are inserting mostly from the femoral line. This is the balloon. This is the tip of the in, uh, IABP catheter with a big balloon with a capacity of 25 to 50 cc in which there is the inflation of this balloon by the helium gas that is very having low turbulence and early inflation and we, uh, causing less resistance. So this is the balloon that we are inserting. This is the markers. This is the various components of the IABP. Here you can put the stellar. These are the suture pads. There are the gas lumens in which from here the gas will insufflate the balloon and it will get inflated. And now this is the only catheter. Now how to put it? You have to sterilize the area, put the local injection, uh, fluoroscopy guided or maybe the ultrasound guided uh, entrance of the femoral artery. Then you have to put the sheath, the transducer sheet, and from inside the sheath, you have to put that balloon and then to reach the balloon. So where this tip of the balloon should be there, ideally it should be distal, two centimeter distal to the left subclavian artery. And this proximal part of this should be above the bifurcation of the both renal arteries. Otherwise the kidney perfusion will get obstructed if that will go. So here the proximal marker should be above the bifurcation of the renal arteries and this tip should be 2 cm distal to the left subclavian artery. So you have to put the pressures, inflate. This is the machine of the intraaortic balloon in which you have to uh, set the various, like how you have to, what is the mechanism that I will just, just two lines for that. This balloon should inflate in the diastolic phase so that it will cause increased coronary perfusion and it will deflate in the sister so that the negative pressure it will cause further improvement of the cardiac output, increasing the cardiac perfusion in the diastolic phase and in the mostly used in the patients who are having cardiogenic shock or the MI causing cardiac failure, acute ischemia causing cardiac failure or in the patients who are having the severe MR and bridging for the surgery. For that patient, this IABP machine is used as a bridge therapy also and in the cardiogenic phase also. So you this actually they can pick the systolic or diastolic phase either from the arterial BP or from the ECG of the ECG leads of the patient. So this I have already told you, the pressurized system, the transducers, the flushing systems are there the pressure tubings and this all you have to connect to the intra-aortic balloon, intra-aortic catheter that I have already shown. This will get inflated in the diastolic phase and increases the diastolic perfusion of the myocardium. So this is just one waveform, the normal waveform I have shown. I am not showing the detail, the early inflation, deflation. So as you can see this is the unassisted systole. So the systole phase is still the diacrotic notch. So when this diacrotic notch came in the diastolic phase, your balloon get inflated in the end. This is your assisted diastole, which is getting assisted by the inflation of the balloon. And this is your assisted end diastole. You see, this is the unassisted waveform and this is the assisted. Here the assisted diastole is more than the normal and the assist, unassisted systole is actually... If you can see, this curve is less than this unassisted systole. So the systolic curve is less and this assisted diastole and assisted end diastolic pressures, this is the main reason why the coronary is getting better perfusion during the diastolic phase. Another is the DVT pumps. DVT pumps mostly using uh, for the inflation of the patient who are bedridden, who are not able to move, the contractility of the veins uh, is not there. The blood gas is stasis and is having high tendency to clot, causing the more DVT. So there are some power switches, some more button modes, the pressure control. There is an inflation and deflation phase so that the circulation of the veins should be there. 
is an inflation of 12 to 14 seconds and the other the rest is a depletion phase in which there is the circulation of the blood flow in the veins is there. So either it's the continuous, the intermittent, there are different, different type of their sequential, which is the foot, maybe a half of the applied to the calf or to the thigh. And different, different type of machines are coming these days. And these are the DVT cuffs that you are putting on the arm. Sometimes a half thigh is half legs and then connecting it to the machine. So there's the alternate compression and re, uh, flexion, uh, relaxation of the cuff so that the circulation is going on and the prevent is there. The last one is the flexi scene in which is a stool collection. The patient who is having the diarrhea and they are having high risk of food, uh, getting the bed sores and the liquid diarrhea is there. Patient is getting very uncomfortable. In which there is, this is the cuff that you have to insert inside the anal sphincter and whole of the liquid motion will get collected in this bag. This is called the flexi scene which you will collect here in all the bag. So it's either there is some in, uh, ports that you can inflate this cuff here in the inner sphincter with the ports here or sometimes you have to insert it inside with the finger like this inside the inner sphincter and inflate it so that whatever volume of stool is there it will get collected in the bag here. You can monitor the stool output monitoring so then see how much of the fluid loss is there. And this helps to prevent the bed sore in the diarrhea patients who are long-standing bedridden patients. They prevent this. Let's see. Is so these are the all the tubes and lines that we are using in the, I think I hope I have covered a lot of things. Stop um, share screen, Neha. Sorry, sir. Stop the share screen if you are finished. Yeah. So these are the things that we are using various from the rise tube, EVD drains, intercostal tubes, ascitic tubes, Foley's catheter, three-way lumen, the stool culture, the video laryngoscope, the fiber optic, IABP, TPI. I think a lot of tubes and lines we have covered in this session. But besides that, definitely the practical when you are using these tubes, then you will get to know these things better. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Nea. Very nicely covered. And you've been speaking for a long time. You must be tired. So really, thank you. Uh, long session. So friends, if there are any questions, we'll take the session with the questions. And uh, we'll wait for a couple of minutes. And uh, if you have any questions later on, when you see the video, as it will be up on a channel in uh, a week or so, then you can uh, put it up in the question box in the comment section. So we'll take the questions there. So... Uh, I think that was very exhaustive and we tried to cover as much as possible. She showed you some uh, actual specimens also and the uh, rest of the things she showed in the slides. And I uh, hope this will be useful to the students for the exams and uh, to the practicing people for their day-to-day uh, -day work. And uh, of course, the, the idea was not to show the procedures as such because the procedures can be learned only at the bedside. So that we have to learn from your seniors at the bedside. So I think there are no questions, Dr. Nea. So thank you so much. Thank the audience uh, for their patience and uh, joining in. With that, we shall conclude. Okay, Nea, thank you. Thank you, sir.